Please welcome the Acting Director of the Navy Center for Applied Research in AI at the U.S. Naval Research Laboratory, Dr. David Aha. Good morning and thank you very much. My name is David Aha. I'm with the Naval Research Laboratory. Uh, I lead the Explainable AI Program's evaluation team, and unfortunately, Program Manager Dave Gunning can't be here with us today, so you're stuck with me. Uh, lucky you. So, the XAI program is focusing on perhaps the most important task today that's uh, facing our AI systems that are machine learning enabled. So I'd like to explain. On the left-hand side of, this, of the slide that you're looking at uh, is a uh, training set that is composed of a set of images, all drawn from the same distribution. This is given to a learning process, or if you prefer, a learning algorithm or architecture, and the output of this induced is a model of the training data. Uh, that data depicted, uh, sorry, the model depicted here as a learned function is in, and also depicted here as a deep net, but it could be of any type of output, really, uh, is then capable of being given another uh, example, in this case an image from the same training distribution, to be able to generate a prediction for us. The problem that we're facing is that this prediction is not accompanied typically by a justification for that specific prediction or by anything that provides insight on the model that was learned. This can leave the user very frustrated, as you can imagine, particularly if they're responsible for critical applications. And they have, may have many questions in mind that they'd like the system to be able to answer for us. Some of these are depicted in the top right-hand side. Okay, so with that, what the XAI program is trying to address is this very issue. They're trying to uh, create a new generation of machine learning processes that instead output what we're referring to as an explainable model. This, generated by the XAI performer teams, is also accompanied by their explanation interface, which is a user interface that allows the user to be able to interrogate that explainable model and thus be able to answer these kinds of questions so they can get an understanding of why this prediction was generated. Can they make predictions as to what the model would do with new inputs? Can they understand when to trust the model, et cetera? And this is a very important advance that we want to be able to accomplish. So the XCI performers are focusing on two types of challenge problems in this, in this uh, program. The first of which is referred to as data analytics, shown on the left, and the right-hand side, autonomous control, or autonomy, shown on the right. With respect to data analytics, uh, one example type of application we have in mind is that in which an intelligence analyst is working with an AI system that's machine learning enabled, and that system is responsible for looking at imagery and being able to identify certain objects in the imagery or certain activities or certain uh, threats that they want to predict are taking place or exhibited through the imagery. And it, uh, the system then provides recommendations to the analyst as to how they may want to um, uh, respond to what they're seeing. But it's a separate task for the analyst to make decisions upon that, this response task. So they really want to understand and be able to trust the system in terms of its recommendations and its predictions. On the right-hand side, in terms of autonomous control, we have a set of operators who are interested in why certain actions are being taken by, in this case, this autonomous vehicle. Now, in some cases, the vehicle might be within sight. In other cases, the vehicle might be out of sight, meaning that the vehicle might have access to some situation information that they can't even see at that point in time. So when they want to interrogate this, they may want to do so in a post hoc situation, such as an after, after action analysis, or maybe even during the time period in which the vehicle is uh, performing the mission. So you can see in both cases, explanations are critical to these users. So what the XCI program is all about is to address this fundamental trade-off of performance versus explainability. You may be very familiar with, by now, the uh, advent of deep learning and how it's impacted this, this trade-off. In particular, for certain types of applications, those in which uh, we're working with raw sensor data, deep learning applications have been shown to be able to greatly increase learning performance. But there has often been the case that it's been in the sacrifice of explainability in some notional form. XAI is instead focused on the task of being able to increase explainability without sacrificing learning performance. So we're trying to go to the top right-hand side of that curve, uh, excuse me, that bar graph, that, that graph that you see there. Uh, in doing so, the goal is to be able to create a new generation of AI systems that are machine learning enabled 
in which users can understand uh, the uh, learned models, understand why these predictions are being generated, uh, understand when they can trust the model, and be able to work with it effectively to manage it in upcoming critical applications. So that's a quick introduction to the XAI program. What I'll be doing next is instead highlighting six contributions to the program. The first three pertain to data analytics, and the latter three will pertain to autonomous control. So the first one here pertains to a method that's called RISE. This is developed by the Boston University sub-team of uh, UC Berkeley. So RISE, or um, randomized, uh, I keep forgetting, right? Randomized input sampling for explanations is focused on the first of those questions that you were looking at before. Why did you give me this prediction? So here we see a surprising prediction. It's saying from this aerial imagery, you know, what we're looking at it appears to be a shopping mall is instead predicting that it's a solar farm, which begs the question as to why. So what RISE does is it generates these heat maps in which it's trying to identify for each pixel in the image its salience or importance with respect to each possible prediction. So it does this by probing the model with these uh, masked versions of the images. And in doing so, it's trying to identify if we drop out a region and replace it by other pixels, uh, or, or the pixel values in that particular region, or if we actually later on add them in, we're looking for areas which maximally change the prediction of the system. RISE has been shown to be able to generate very accurate heat maps. So uh, in the middle here, we see one such example, and that is with respect to the top rank prediction of solar farm. And we begin to understand, we see that the heat map's really focused on the, this area in the image that looks like it might be confusable with that of a solar farm just by looking at the uh, characteristics of that part of the image. On the right-hand side, in contrast, these, this is the heat map for the uh, shopping mall. And guess what? It seems that the system is attending to the road to the lower right-hand side or the uh, parking lot. And you gather from this that it's a much more complicated task to make a prediction that just given this aerial image, it appears to be a shopping mall. And this is, this is uh, allowing us to be able to get additional insight on the image itself. One th important thing about RISE, in contrast to a lot of the previous approaches for doing this, is that it can work with any type of black box model, which is very encouraging. It's a nice advance. So while this was working and focusing on issues of trying to analyze an image, this next topic focuses instead on the second question, which is what's going on inside that, that uh, learned model. This work by the MIT sub-team of uh, Raytheon BBN is uh, focusing on uh, a topic that uh, they refer to as network dissection. Partic in particular, this is with respect to convolutional neural networks and trained networks. So I'm depicting here a very simplification of this network in which we have uh, five or so layers of hidden units from top to bottom, from input to something that's close to the output. On the left-hand side here, we're showing uh, one image for each layer. And in that image, there are certain types of objects that can be seen if you squint hard, like trees, sky, things of that nature. And the right-hand side, there's a bar chart, effectively. For each possible concept, it could be detected by an individual hidden unit in there. Uh, how highly is it responding to that? The number of concepts is relatively small, the top layer, because it turns out there aren't a whole lot of different human labelable abstractions in that layer. In contrast, as we go down, you see the number of concepts and textures, et cetera, becomes much more numerous. OK, so uh, what network uh, dissection does is it's trying to identify uh, the classes or object to which each hidden unit responds strongly. They can refer to this as the semantics of the hidden unit. Uh, it, <clears throat> excuse me, it does this in three steps. The first step is to, for the uh, researchers to gather a very large set of imagery. Now, we may have one subset of the images that pertains to one concept, like baseballs. And another one might be faces, and another one might be so-and-so. And this very large number of images in the second step is then given to each one of the hidden units. So this is very exhaustive, as you see. And uh, the idea is to be able to identify for the hidden units which, which concepts they respond strongly to. Um, they're looking at this uh, using a thresholding approach. So, the, the end result of this is that they can say that for a particular hidden unit, that it is a detector for a certain subset of concepts. And this is very informative. So uh, one thing they can do with this information is say the following. Given two trained networks, one which is very good for detecting one, type, one set of concepts, another one for detecting uh, a, maybe a partially overlapping set of concepts, which do I want to use for my application? 
If I have that knowledge, I can be better informed as to which one I want to use. Similarly, with respect to actually training these networks, they can identify the impact on the set of learned concepts based upon their decisions for how they're going to be able to train the system. There are many different architectures, as you know, and that can have a great impact upon uh, how they do this. This is focusing on the very popular topic of deep reinforcement learning. Now, you may know that deep reinforcement learning has had tremendous success with, uh, among other things, the task of being able to play these old Atari, Atari games uh, particularly well, and that's grabbed a lot of headlines earlier on. Here's one. This is Breakout. Um, I'll show on the top left-hand side. Uh, so the way that they do it is successful, but it takes a long time. If you can squint at the figure on the right-hand side, you'll see an orange training curve that is showing that, yes, we can learn a very good reward, but unfortunately, it's taking 10 to the 8 steps for doing that, and there's a good reason why. It turns out that these physical simulation environments in these games are not well suited for deep learning uh, training. And the reason why is because they're not differentiable. They're not um, uh, particularly suited for a gradient-based learning control system. So what they say is, perhaps you can guess, they want to be able to uh, replace that with a differentiable um, physics engine, and they literally encode such, such a model in one of the layers of the networks. So of the network that's being trained, excuse me. And by doing so, they're enabling learning of the environment parameter settings uh, to match the observed behavior and to improve control performance. And guess what? By doing this, by, by feeding back the errors to, to learning um, with, with respect to that layer, they're able to get a much faster training rate. So on the blue uh, curve is displaying that, in which now it's only taking us about 10 to the 4 steps to be able to learn to play Pong, uh, excuse me, break out particularly well. Uh, this is also enhancing explainability, because now that I've got an embedded physics model in the engine, I can throw all sorts of ex explanation extraction uh, tools at this, and that's what they're working on right now. So the next example, this is the one from Oregon State, is, is particularly interesting because of the, the way that they're dropping in additional structure to the network. So they're focusing on uh, learning finite state representations for, the re for these recurrent policy networks, specifically focusing on recurrent neural networks. And what they say is, aha, we can take this training process and we can splice in what they, they, what they call quantized bottleneck networks. These QBNs are encoder-decoder networks. Perhaps you're familiar with them. You start with a set, a high dimensionality set of nodes at the input layer. You successfully reduce the dimensionality until you come up with something that's comparatively small in the number of dimensions, a, ve a vector representation, from which you then explode it to have eventually the same dimensionality as the initial input. Uh, a layer, but they, it, in such a way that it matches, it replicates their, their values. So once you've got these trained, you can actually, and they do so for two, two purposes in the recurrent neural networks, one for modeling the, the, the observables and one for modeling the memory state. What they do is they actually replace parts of the recurrent neural network with them, and voila, they're in a good position to be able to extract something interesting from these finite vectors. They're able to extract a particular type of finite state machine, which is called a Mori machine. And what wasn't known before is that these extractions, these, these abstract representations, are surprisingly simple. So in the left-hand case here, we're looking at Pong. And uh, it turns out that, uh, and this wasn't known before, it, it turns out that the memory is completely ignored. It's, it, sorry, the memory is completely ignored. The only thing that's looked at are the observables, the inputs. It's as if it's going directly from the pixels itself to make its decision in the policy. And this contrasts greatly with the example shown in the middle. Now that, if you can't see very well, is a bowling uh, game. On the left-hand side of which is showing a, a human icon, on the right-hand side is showing the remaining pins that are up. It's just the opposite there. In this case, it's, absor it's ignoring the observables and it's just focusing on memory. It's as if they've memorized for a particular state. Here's what you do. Here's, here's the way you want to roll the ball in order to, to maximize the number of pins to get the greatest reward. On the right-hand side is yet another example, but I don't really want to go into it. The point is, is that we've, by, by uh, extracting simple, explainable, finite state representations from this very complicated network, they're able to uh, go to great lengths to provide a better understanding as to what the network is, uh, sorry, what the model, uh, learn model is all about, and to make predictions for it. The final example is one that pertains to work by the UCB team. And uh, this pertains in particular to um, the very important topic of uh, self-driving cars, as you see in the uh, figure. So um, what the UCB team is doing is that uh, they're, they're giving this input image stream to the system, 
which is then extracting out these, uh, these heat maps again. These heat maps are then being uh, given to a clustering analysis procedure, which is being able to provide to us uh, visual uh, detections and a causality check on, on what's going on. Uh, in addition, information being provided to the first of their two-step process is, uh, and that information is the acceleration information as well as the control information from the human driver. So that information is given to uh, the, vehicle the uh, vehicle controller, and it's using a spatial attention uh, model to train a convolutional network <clears throat> from images to output vehicle control commands. These control commands are then given to an explanation generator, which is using an attention-based video to text model to produce text explanations of these model actions. And it's important to note that the explanations are grounded to scene parts that matter to the controller. Arguably, what they're generating are these fairly plausible descriptions and explanations of what's taking place, as you see in, in regards to this video. And it's also providing, with respect to the heat map, an attention vis visualization capability of their evidence. OK, so uh, I'll finish up with this final slide. Uh, one thing I want to say is that I've described to you six examples that pertain to deep learning, but there's a lot more going on. It, it's really a very exciting program. Uh, in particular, there is work that, as you see from the list of explainable models, that's going on in regards to causal modeling, as well as uh, with respect to um, uh, uh, stochastic and or graphs, and work on, on uh, probabilistic uh, logic models as well. The teams are split in terms of whether or not they're going after both uh, challenge problems or just one or the other, as depicted on the left-hand side. So we've just gone through phase one, and as part of the evaluation team, I was happy to receive uh, information as to how well their human subject studies have done. And what they found is that when they're comparing human subjects, though some who do and some who do not have, are, are, are not given explanations. In fact, they're, they're showing what they want to show, which is that uh, given explanations, the humans are, are, are doing much better. They're preferring to use those explanations. There's also been uh, uh, evidence to show that uh, uh, given the explanations, they've engendered appropriate trust of the users in the systems. And in some cases, it's helped the users to be able to better understand the mental, um, the mental well, better be, to align their mental model with the system. Um, having said that, one drawback is that if the system provides an incorrect explanation, that can be very damaging to these measures. And so that's something that the, uh, the uh, XAI performers are trying, trying to focus on. So we've been working with the Psychology of Explanation sub-team, uh, led by Robert Hoffman on by HMC. He's been doing fantastic work. Terrific survey is coming out of that work that's multidisciplinary in content in terms of the social sciences and AI and, and other areas as well. Um, and they're also helping us with being able to identify some of the uh, e explanation effectiveness measures that I'm alluding to but not discussing explicitly here. Uh, we're really excited to see, as we step into phase two now, the work that's going to be done by the XAI performers over the next two years, and we're keeping, keeping close tabs on them. So having said that, uh, that ends my presentation, and, and, and uh, thanks for listening. So. Okay.